the president received the first word of the fighting at 4 o'clock in the morning, the 5th of June. In the Situation Room of the White House, the all too familiar maps of Southeast Asia had been replaced with those of the Eastern Mediterranean. The president had bent every effort for two weeks to avert hostilities. And now that diplomacy had given way to war, his one compelling task was to contain it, to tamp it out. The team had been assembled, men for whom foreign affairs have long since become a way of life. And as one columnist observed, for whom foreign crises have become the coin of daily living. As the war progressed, false charges would be made, attempting to brand the United States and Great Britain as active participants. The unspoken peril lurking behind each embassy report, each cable, was the ever-present threat of direct confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union. And now, with fighting in progress, it was imperative to avoid miscalculation, misunderstanding. At 8 o'clock, the Soviet Premier, Alexei Kosygin, and the President of the United States exchanged direct teletype messages, advising that their respective governments would not intervene with armed force. That one exchange said more than weeks of diplomatic effort. At that moment, the world was apprised of the fact that the two powers could, with restraint and reason, prevent conflict from spreading and ultimately engulfing others. Directly following their initial conference in the Situation Room, he asked Secretary Rusk and Secretary McNamara to brief both Senate and House leaders. The President returned to the Oval Office to monitor the initial exchange of statements on the floor of the United Nations Security Council. The Council had been called into urgent session upon the outbreak of hostilities. It was through this forum that the United States would now concentrate all its energies to bring about an immediate ceasefire. As the day developed, the major obstacle to agreement on a ceasefire lay in the question of troop withdrawal. Under the leadership of the Security Council President Hans Tabor, a draft resolution agreeable to the competing interests would be drawn up on the following day. As in the agreement to contain and limit the conflict, the key to the unconditional ceasefire lay in the joint and parallel action of the United States and the Soviet Union. The news flashes clarified the situation. It soon became apparent that the Middle East power patterns of a decade were being changed in a matter of hours. Military analysts called it a lightning war. Although the fighting would continue for six days, the verdict of the battlefield had been rendered during the opening round. The road to a permanent peace in the Middle East would be a long one. Far more issues were raised by the fighting than were settled. To coordinate American policy on the problems the government would face in the aftermath of the conflict, President Johnson established a special committee of the National Security Council. He asked McGeorge Bundy to serve as its executive secretary. The war on the deserts of the Sinai involved far more than governmental concern. Blood ties, national origins, and deep-seated sympathies made themselves felt virtually to the doorstep of the White House. No more Israel! No more Israel! Palestine is out! 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 By the 8th of June, only the Arab state of Jordan had agreed to accept the ceasefire resolution. At the very moment that President Johnson was drafting a statement on the current situation to Senator Mike Mansfield, word was passed to the White House and the nation alike that Egypt too had agreed to the ceasefire.
On the 10th of June, Syria, the last Arab holdout, agreed to a ceasefire. The fighting was now stopped. At his 102nd news conference, the president advised that the best action for the moment was to let things clear up and let the people of the area and the world realize just what had happened. The tensions that had built during the first 10 days in June were dissolved in a welcome round of old-fashioned partisan politics. Returning to Austin, Texas, the hub of his old congressional district, Lyndon Johnson was greeted by incumbent Congressman Jake Pickle. It was a good time to meet a whole new generation of constituents, including at least one who seemed a little unsure of his political convictions. However, a little persuasion from the number one party leader was all that was needed to bring him into the fold. The main event of the evening was a Southwest Democratic dinner with loyal fundraisers from five states attending. Also sharing in the festivities, daughter Lucy, soon to be visited by the stork. The tab for the evening was $1,000 per plate, but on the menu besides crab meat cocktail and Kansas City strip sirloins was a Democratic Party approaching solvency. And for the president, it was a chance to relax in a down-home atmosphere. After three weeks of wrestling with the Middle East, it's a real pleasure to come home tonight to the peace and quiet of Texas politics. In case there should be in evidence tonight any differences of opinion, I want to make my own position abundantly clear in the beginning. I am for peace, territorial integrity, political independence, and the unrestricted navigation in the Houston Ship Channel. <laughs> 